but I think the Secretary is right. And that is that the American people are sick and tired of hearing about your damn emails. Thank you. Me too. Me too. <laughs> okay. So, I hope you're not going to be sick about the damn emails. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a kind of a long talk, but this topic actually requires that. Uh, there's a lot of background to get into. Uh, because we've been talking largely about this email server information of being on that or not being on it. And this is work, joint work with um, one of your peers who just graduated in uh, 2017, Chris Salahub, who did most of the heavy lifting here, as you can imagine. Um, and we put this together and produced the website, which you, you may have been able to look at. And we're going to look at the uh, Hillary Clinton's email and think about what the information is in metadata. Okay? <clears throat> so. Why? Well, e email is interesting as a data source. And you don't often get access to email unless you're working for some agency that I'd rather not work for, right? So it's rare to be able to access this stuff and be able to see play with some messy data. And it's also a challenge to think about what kind of generic tools you might develop to uh, uh, explore this, this kind of data. And if past experience is any indication, it's actually very productive set of data to actually look at. So this is an old story of the Enron <clears throat> company that was a, a golden company in the 90s, making tons and tons of money. Lots of people invested in it, their pensions and all kinds of things. And then it crashed because there were all kinds of, it wasn't the most transparent company in the world. They got into trouble and people lost lots of money. People ended up going to jail. And there's a whole collection of emails trying to figure out who did what, when, who knew what, when. So there's actually about 500,000, more than 500,000 emails in the Enron database that you can look at. Some people have claimed that there's, they've, they've called some even more. And it was all required by law to be available to see what was going on so you could track. And it's been a, uh, even as late as, when is this, July 2013, I mean, it, it's been a long time and people are using it in lots of machine learning and tools can develop on the back of uh, looking at this big database. And so I think the um, Clinton email is another little interesting one. Why else? <clears throat> well, there's this guy, this guy that sort of told us all about all kinds of bad things that were happening, sort of mass warrantless, that was without an uh, authorized warrant collection of at least metadata and likely much more. Everybody knows who this guy is, right? Okay, so Edward Snowden is here. The FBI and NSA are tapping into the servers that hold our Facebook accounts, our Gmail and Hotmail correspondence, and much, maybe even most, of what we all do on the internet. That's according to these slides obtained by the Washington Post describing the capture of emails, photos, videos, a lot of our stuff from most of the internet's biggest players. And that's how the story broke. Uh, so these are names that if you've seen Citizen Four or other things, these are names that you will uh, see there. And you'll notice that throughout, I'll be marking, you can't, not very effectively, it turns out with this projector, dates, because dates are really important in, in this data set, what we're getting and what's happening over time. So we have that information. This program does not involve the content of phone calls or the names of people making calls. Instead, it provides a record of phone numbers and the times and lengths of calls. Metadata. So, Obama, President of the United States, is trying to calm people down, but metadata is not that big a deal. Right? Don't worry about it. You can go to sleep at night. It's not really an invasion of privacy in any, any sort of way. So, I want to think about well, what is metadata and what, what can we learn from it? And, even in the most recent uh, presidential election, this is one of the uh, Republican candidates, Jeb Bush, brother of uh, George W. Bush, who the politicians are very happy to have metadata. They think it's a good thing. So he's congratulating Obama for continuing this NSA, National Security Agency, metadata program. So the folks that are in power do like to have metadata. They think it's a great thing, but it's not that, that invasive. So, what we have here is just as a bunch of reasons for doing this. And 
exercise the opportunity in the focus of this particular data set. And so try to suggest what can we learn from metadata? What can you actually get out of some very simple bits of data? And the opportunity is this publicly released email or other corpus of, corp of, of, of uh, email around it. But this is publicly released by the State Department. It's not a bad thing. And the focus is kind of bizarre compared to the Enron, that this is a particular individual, right? All the email to and from them. So you can imagine yourself, this is your email for a few years and what we, what we might have on it, what we might be able to do. Now, this person is very public person, so there's lots more information about this person than they may be about you. But looking at you guys, I'm sure you grew up with posting a lot of stuff that you probably regret having posted all of your <laughs> high school days, et cetera. So... <clears throat> And important thing here is that all data are understood within a context. So there's a significant amount of, oops, how did I get that? There's a significant amount of, of making that go away. I'm just going to go over here and make that go away. There's a significant, a very rich context. Okay. So there's a lot of information available. Um, and you need to understand that context. And I don't know how much been very busy the past few years. I'm not sure how much time you spent worrying about this problem or being tuned in. And in fact, I didn't know as much about it as I know now, having looked into this data set and then followed the leads, etc. So we're going to have to learn a little bit about that. And it begins, if you look at this time period, September 6, 2012. And this is when Obama is uh, hoping to be re-elected as a second term U.S. president. This is at the Democratic National Convention where he's clearly the incumbent, the candidate, and his speech to the National Convention. Uh, I've edited this significantly, but just to give you a sense of the kind of narrative that he has in his campaign of how he wants to present his previous administration and distinguish it from one that before. You can choose leadership that has been tested and proved. Four years ago, I promised to end the war in Iraq. We did. I promised to refocus on the terrorists who actually attacked us on 9-11, and we have. We blunted the Taliban's momentum in Afghanistan, and in 2014, our longest war will be over. A new tower rises above the New York skyline. Al-Qaeda is on the path to defeat, and Osama bin Laden is dead. Tonight, we pay tribute to the Americans who still serve in harm's way. From Burma to Libya to South Sudan, we have advanced the rights and dignity of all human beings, men and women, Christians and Muslims and Jews. But for all the progress that we've made, challenges remain. Terrorist plots must be disrupted. Europe's crisis must be contained. Our commitment to Israel's security must not waver. And neither must our pursuit of peace. The historic change sweeping across the Arab world must be defined not by the iron fist of a dictator or the hate of extremists, but by the hopes and aspirations of ordinary people who are reaching for the same rights that we celebrate here today. So now we have a choice. My opponent and his running mate are new to foreign policy. Okay, so you, you see the narrative that in, in the past with George W. Bush, there was this horrible 9 11 event, and a couple of wars were started, and all kinds of bad things happened. And now this guy's got the terrorists on the run. There's the Arab Spring, everybody wants democracy across North Africa and the Middle East, and lots, lots of things happen. I killed Bin Laden, you know. Everything's going my way, it's way better than anything else. And that's the narrative. We've got the terrorists on the, on the run. And that's important to have this narrative when you're trying to run for election. Okay, so whether this is deserved or not, this, this is part of the narrative. And look at this date, September 6, 2012. So think about that time. 2012 is the elect year of the election in September 6, which is getting close to a, sign close to a significant um, anniversary. And that is September 11, 2012. And what I'm going to show you is the breaking news of that day on CNN 
live, and there are going to be two events described, and I want you to look in, at the one and the characteristics of the one and the characteristics of the second one. As they both described, here's breaking news. But these protesters, they were predominantly Islamist people who were angry about a film that came out which depicts, which they say depicts Muhammad in a bad light, which they say insults the Prophet. Basically, things that Muslims would find offensive. So there was roughly a thousand people out there going and we saw a handful of people actually storm the embassy uh, perimeter. They tore down the American flag. Security forces were off on the side. They eventually did show up to separate the protesters from the embassy. Uh, I want to go to uh, Benghazi in Libya to, uh, to, uh, to Jamana who is there. Uh, you're in Tripoli. You've been talking to, uh, to a source in Benghazi uh, where, where this uh, person working at the consulate was just, was just confirmed killed. What's the latest that you're hearing on the situation there? Well, Anderson, according to the eyewitness, up until about an hour ago, he described the situation there as a front line. Uh, Libyan security forces were engaged in heavy clashes uh, with members of an armed group that is Ansar al Sharia, that is a radical militant group that is based in eastern Libya. Uh, he also reported rocket propelled grenades uh, hitting the uh, consulate building. Okay, so two, two different events, same day you know, on the anniversary of 9 11. One's in Cairo, Egypt. If you saw that, that first one, there's a thousand plus people in protest, and they're doing what protesters do, right? And then they a handful storm, storm the, uh, the outside of the embassy and take the American flag and do things that people want to see done to the American flag. The second one, you've got uh, brain launchers, right? Rocket propelled grenades and everything else. It's, it's rather different than a thing that's actually an attack. It's, it's quite a different kind of set up. So, now this is the narrative that's being presented to the, um, uh, the American people in the world. So, this is so, uh, Senator Clinton, uh, sorry, not Senator, Secretary Clinton's uh, public statement at that time. I'll just draw your attention to the blue part. Um, so, some have sought to justify this vicious behavior as a response to inflammatory material posted on the internet. That's a movie. The United States deplores any intentional effort to denigrate the religious beliefs of others. Our commitment to religious tolerance goes back to the very beginning of our nation. So it seems there's this horrible film. People are spontaneously responding to this. It's, it's a bad thing. So that's September 11th at 10 p.m. And the very same day, or early the next day, there's a conversation between Hillary Clinton and the president of Egypt. And this is a transcript that says, uh, we know that the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. It was a planned attack, not a protest. Um, you're not kidding. Based on the information we saw today, we believe the group that claimed responsibility for this was affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Uh, all this other stuff is redacted, removed, so we don't get to see that, but we do get to see these things. And these are all a result of the various investigations that I'll talk about, how, how this came about. So a different, very different narrative than what she's saying. So she's said one thing publicly, and this was to the president of of Egypt. Uh, President Obama, September 12th, uh, just point out that Benghazi thing, if you don't know this, uh, was a, an attack on this mission in, in Benghazi, this U.S. or an ex, it wasn't their, con, uh, their embassy, but uh, another city in, called Benghazi. Um, the ambassador died, and, and another tech support of their staff died in the attack. Other people were sort of rescued by a nearby CIA mission, and so four people died. Two, two of them were people in defense that were actually armed, and the other two were um, just part of the State Department. So there's State Department, there's CIA, two different places. Um, it's kind of a, a complicated story. So Obama says all of this, it's outrageous uh, to attack on their diplomatic facility in Benghazi. It's the lives of four Americans, including the ambassador, the ambassador of the, the United States. So. While the United States rejects efforts to denigrate the religious beliefs of others, we must all unequivocally oppose this kind of, the kind of senseless violence that took the lives of these public servants. So to, to, well, there's a narrative here that's going to go along with, goes along with the election um, uh, platform. And let me catch that. This is uh, four days later. Um, you go out and you literally meet the press, right? So this is the Sunday news stores, stories. Uh, it's not 
of the Secretary of State, who you might imagine would go out and meet the press, but rather um, Susan Rice, who's the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., September 16th, and here's the... How much longer can Americans expect to see these troubling images and these protests go forward? Well, David, we can't predict with any certainty. Uh, but let's remember uh, what has transpired over the last several days. Uh, this is a response uh, to a hateful and offensive video that was uh, widely disseminated uh, throughout the Arab and Muslim world. Obviously, our view is that there is absolutely no excuse for violence uh, and that uh, what has happened is condemnable. But this is a, a spontaneous reaction uh, to a video, and it's not dissimilar, but perhaps on a slightly larger scale than what we have seen in the past with the satanic verses, uh, with the, the cartoon of uh, the Prophet Muhammad. So a spontaneous reaction to this video in Benghazi, uh, nothing planned, etc. So that, that's, that's the narrative. Um, the guys that were actually involved in the firefight, seeing this, got kind of upset, and they started agitating for things. And so if more information becomes available. So this October 5th, you know, asking was, what was the security like? I mean, how come these guys got in trouble like this? Was there security added in this troublesome time, or was it taken away, or what? Uh, and there's lots of news stories in this time period in early October, October 18th. So now Congress starts to get involved, right? The House of Representatives and the, and the uh, U.S. Senate uh, trying to investigate what goes on. I mean, nobody got your embassy, or not your embassy, but your a consulate or mission destroyed, your ambassador killed. Nobody's really happy about that sort of thing, so you want to investigate how, where was the failure. So this starts to get legs, and it's an election year. The election is in November, right? I think it's November 6th or something like that. So October 18th. And then Fox News uh, has this exclusive, where these, the CIA operators, these guys that were involved in the firefight, uh, alleged that they were in fact denied a request for help during the Benghazi attack. So this is, the story started to get more and more complicated. And, um, People are, are beginning to wonder, so now, um, how does this relate to the email? So, I'm going to have to give you a compressed timeline here of what's going on in the email. And so, you have to go back to 2008 when um, Hillary Clinton signals that she will uh, agree to be Secretary of State for Obama. Uh, and uh, in January, this domain, ClintonEmail.com, if you look at who is Clinton to find exactly when it started, uh, it's registered, um, and the servers in Clinton's house in Chappaqua, New York. Uh, later that month, she becomes Secretary of State. So, a few years later, September 11th, there's an attack on Benghazi, and um, shortly thereafter, I think this is probably the day after the election, if I remember correctly, um, Freedom of Information requests, uh, Freedom of Information Act of FOIA, FOIA requests for Benghazi start, well, Benghazi-related emails. Um, in January of the next year, she testifies to the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee about Benghazi. Uh, in February 1, 2014, she leaves the State Department. And roughly speaking, that's our timeline of where the emails live. Okay? So... In 2014, the House Benghazi Committee has formally announced a new committee to investigate the Benghazi thing. And it starts subpoenaing uh, Benghazi documents, so it's a force of law, you have to produce the documents. And March is when the use of this uh, private email server becomes public. So that's when it's finally public. And it also explains why the State Department was having trouble uh, fulfilling these FOIA requests. So, March 10th, right, once it becomes public, um, Clinton tells the reporters that she has turned over 30,000 plus emails to the State Department and deleted 31,000. So, we turn over, turn over about half of the emails that she has on the server and deleted the rest. And she tasked three lawyers, these names will become significant, Cheryl Mills, which was Clinton's former chief of staff, David Kendall, her personal lawyer, and Heather Samuelson, a State Department staffer to make the determination of which emails were work related and which were not. The House Committee requests that it be turned over to a neutral third party to make that determination. Um, on the 27th, her lawyer informs them that no emails remain on the private server. They're gone. You turn over what you've got. 
And finally, the sysadmin, Paul Combetta, erases all backups using uh, leech bin. So it's really writing over the stuff. There's no way of recovering it. It's gone. So whatever she didn't turn over is gone. And in April, um, she uh, announces her candidacy for the presidency. I think that's going to, you don't want to lie down at the bottom here, Glenn, and hold that down. <laughs> so these guys come back to the sysadmin, Mills, her, her uh, chief of staff, and Samuelson are also uh, later granted partial immunity by the Justice Department during an FBI investigations. That's the timeline. Okay. So what does it look like? I shouldn't walk in front of that, should I? Um, so if you go to the U.S. State Department looking for Clinton's emails, you'll find this. This is the kind of page you arrive at, and there's the URL if you want to go check it out yourself. Um, so you get a list of these things, and it's it's searchable, so you can search for terms and find things. And you can see, you know, the, the obvious tabular structure here of, of the, the subject and the, uh, the dates and who it's to and from, et cetera. Um, what they've done is they've taken all the emails that were printed, uh, redacted, like how it's, when it was classified and taken away, um, then I guess scanned again in all the PDFs. So you'll find PDFs here. What's more helpful for us is WikiLeaks. So WikiLeaks has a copy of all the PDFs as well. Um, so there are, I think, uh, there are over 32,000 of these. There, and if you go to the WikiLeaks site, you can also search um, for any term in the email and get up a search thing like this. So I'm looking at, I think I've boxed that, yeah. So I'm looking at the dates around that attack at Benghazi, and that search will produce a result like that. So you see, you get a bunch of information. Now you're we're trying to think, well, how are we going to get this data? How are we going to handle and have a peek at what's under the covers here? So you want to look at what's here. You know where you are, so that's important, right? And you've got these other things. So one thing you've got is the doc ID, and every email has its own ID. And it turns out is that that plus the number will get you that email. Okay, so that's a bit of information for extraction. This is clearly metadata. That's the date of the thing. Uh, from and to metadata, that's sort of like who, who is the phone number is calling to and from. And uh, you also notice that they're either to or from Clinton. So Clinton's always in one of these things, so Clinton's always one party to these emails. And you've got guys like Cheryl Mills, we know Chief of Staff, other people, Robert Russo, Diane Reynolds, uh, Jake Sullivan, and Sidney Blumenthal. Um, all, in, all interesting names, particularly uh, Mills, Reynolds, Sullivan, and Blumenthal. And so you think, well, who are these folks? So you've got names. So you've got names, you can find out who they are. You can Google this stuff. You can do just what I, what I did. So here are some names that pop up. There's Philip uh, Raines, Huma Abedin, Jake Sullivan, Cheryl Mills. And that's her sort of close staff that she works with a, a fair bit. Um, other members of her staff are Monica Hanley, uh, Lauren Gelati, Claire Coleman, Robert Rousseau, we saw his name earlier, Neera Tandon, uh, Lona Valmoro. So those people are all members of the uh, Secretary of State staff, a part of government. And this interesting character I've written in red, Sidney Blumenthal. And what's interesting is that these folks are all uh, members of the US federal government support staff of Hillary Clinton principally, this guy is not. This guy works for the Clinton Foundation, trying to get a job. They wanted, uh, Hillary Clinton wanted him to have a job in the, in the State Department, but he uh, was refused. So he's not, he's not only he's not in the State Department, but had applied and had not had a position in the State Department. So he's uh, interesting. You see these colors, everybody in here white is definitely in the government, and he's uh, definitely not. Uh, more Dennis Ross, just to fill out the page, Thomas Donilon, you'll see these folks, Melanie Revere, Oscar Flores, now he's in yellow, he's, um, 
he's not quite as interesting as this guy, but he's definitely not in the government. He does work for the Clintons, though, and he does end up like printing email and stuff like that for them off, off the server. And he's a former naval officer. Um, Stroke Talbot and <clears throat> Madeleine Albright, she was the Secretary of State under uh, President Clinton, and she has the moniker Pathfinder. That's how her, her email will appear as Pathfinder often. So it's kind of um, interesting. Uh, and not surprising that the current Secretary of State would consult with the former Secretary of State of the same uh, party to, uh, for uh, all kinds of advice. Here's Diane Reynolds, which turns out to be Chelsea Clinton. Right, so Chelsea Clinton, their daughter, is not using her name, it's just Diane Reynolds. So that's a name we saw before. And here's another one, ACLB, which is Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain. And another member of the Labour Party, David Miliband, you can't see his name at the bottom, a member of the UK Labour Party. So these yellow guys are not part of the government. Okay, so every one of those now will take you somewhere if you start looking down these chains. So just from that little bit of metadata, you start drawing conclusions because this is not all anonymous, right? It's out there. All of your past experience is out there. On machine. So, what are some problems? Well, the, the WikiLeaks data does have some problems in it that are kind of annoying. So they're missing values. See, this one has no subject or to and from that particular message. And when you look at the uh, message itself, you see that it's, it's got a blank to, to and from there. What is that? Um, also, there's some other funny things here. This release in part, B1, 1.4B, etc. So that's an odd thing, like what is that? Like, we didn't know what any of these things were, we just started stumbling upon them like you might be doing exploratory analysis. And <clears throat> so, you, but you can look at the original PDF, so you have a look back and say, well, what are these things? And if you look back in the original PDF, there's no missing header. So WikiLeaks is messing something up going from their PDFs to their, to their HTMLs. They've lost that particular piece. And these things, are clearly added on top of the um, email itself. This one, disheartening news on the Pakistan front, and then all this stuff here, that doesn't look like it's part of an email header, right? That's pasted on top. And here's the content, right? There's nothing in it, mostly redacted. So it's sort of white, um, blanked out. Like I say, I'm gonna have to stand over here. The camera's gonna have one. Okay, so down at the end. So that's not in the PDF. Um, these labels were the redactions. And here's another example. So this is the one from Diane Reynolds. Uh, to hit, uh, from Killer Clinton, Diane Reynolds. Interesting here thing, of course, is September 11th, 11-12. Two of our officers were killed in Benghazi by the Al-Qaeda-like group. The ambassador who I hand, whom I handpicked and a young communications officer on temporary duty with a wife and two young children. Uh, very hard day, and I fear more of the same tomorrow. So, um, information going to family there about this stuff. So, again, release in part B6, and there's an interior email chain. Okay, we're going to try to keep this as simple as possible. I'm not going to pay any attention to the email chain inside because this is just the first cut. The other disturbing thing is these dates in this header do not match what's in this header, these days and times. I mean, we've sampled about, you know, there's 30,000 things, but you can't look at them all. The few that we've sampled, we see that there's some sort of systematic departure uh, between what the dates are in the email and what WikiLeaks provides in that top header. And so there's um, anywhere, I think we saw, you know, um, no difference to uh, seven hours to 31 hours, uh, but not, not anything that's going to affect maybe an analysis in any substantive way. Not that we've seen. And these are the redactions if you look at what the actual um, PDF looked like. And you see that this is all the correct date, 11 p.m. Okay. So, what does it look like? Well, you can get the page source. I mean, not all browsers make this easy for you, but many do. You can just actually say, let me see the page source. And that's useful. So you can see what, what's going on, what's in there. So this is the page source of that email uh, from, Diane, uh, from Hillary Clinton to Diane Reynolds. 
and you see there's you know lots of header stuff here. There's a public key block. There's a lot deleted here. There's a massive public key. It goes on um, talking about the Tor browser. You know, so this is information for people that are submitting something to WikiLeaks. You know, use a Tor browser. Don't use you know um, any of the commercial browsers. You want to protect your identity. A lot of stuff about this. Uh, more things about you know preserving your anonymity. Um, if you have a very large submission, remove tracers. If you're a high risk source in the computer, you prepare blah blah. So we're really protecting their sources, trying to make sure that you don't reveal who you are. Um, and it goes on for some time, right? But none of this is interesting to us. I mean, it's an interesting aside, but it's not the content. So there's a lot of HTML here that's kind of in the way. So you have to find out, well, where is this? And so finally, the content is way down here with conveniently a div class content. Um, and also, this, this top header here, which has the um, title, you know, Hillary Clinton, from Hillary Clinton to uh, Diane Re Re Reynolds, Diane, I guess. And down here, we, you see the release in part, and you've got the email content. This blue is what I've highlighted as the actual email content. Okay? And that's what I said. It's exactly that thing. That's the ID number. So you can go look at the stuff if anybody has a laptop. Um, and the remaining stuff, right? Uninterested to us. So all the one is really affected that, that, on that one page. So we have to make some decisions. So the decisions are, I'm going to, uh, in order of increasing invasiveness, I'm going to examine the dates and times. I'm going to look at the redaction information. Uh, to and from, and I'm just going to keep it simple, look at that first header. I know so I'm going to miss some emails because they're blank, but there aren't that many of them that are like that. And uh, I will look at the content, but just very superficially. Just some simple summaries of what's going on in the content. And, but I get to use other public sources, other government sites, internet searches to see what's going on, news sources, etc. And the goal here is to provide anybody here a public analysis tool so that you can go and explore Hillary Clinton's email. Okay. So, how are you going to get this done? If you haven't seen this before, I'll just give you a quick hint of some of the stuff you're going to look at. This is all done in R. Everything we did was in R. So we're going to grab uh, this, this package, R curl, that allows you to look at your URLs and do things with them. So just to fix it, I've got a path. There's the email ID. I'm going to get an email path, and I'm going to get this URL assign it to that thing. When I print that in my office email, it's going to be one big massive script. Okay? Well, all of the HTML, everything, all that stuff that we saw, which is a bit discouraging. But if I do that for one, I want to write a function to do that for all of one, all of the email. I don't just want this one. So I want to go and grab it. So I can write some function called extract HTML. It's going to go over the ID numbers that I selected this stuff. So to do that, um, right, so we end up with, so that when we do this, if this function works, we get a vector of strings, one for each email, and the question is, what do you worry about? Well, you've got 32,000 emails that you're trying to get from WikiLeaks, right, and you don't want to be doing it one at a time, so you're working program, doing your program, your computer's working hard to do this, you know, the first thing that WikiLeaks is going to think that you're doing it US, right? A dedicated denial of service, so you're trying to attack it. So it's going to shut you out. In fact, it does shut us out. Right? So you just have to be a little more clever about this. You have to write some code that's going to uh, stop and think you now and again, randomly, times in between when it's asking for information. And you're also going to say, try, there's this function, try catch, so that if it fails, I know I've got an error and I can do something to skip on to the next one or something. So I don't have to restart my program all the time. You want to keep track of which ones you've caught and which ones you have yet to catch so that you have to do another run at it. Okay? So whenever you're doing something, and plus, even if they didn't think this, it's just courtesy. You don't want to be sitting there and picking your machine and, and using up all of some other machine that's trying to provide a service. Okay? So, building blocks in R to parse an email. Uh, we use string R for the manipulating strings. That package, cron, for manipulating uh, dates. There are other packages for like looper date for manipulating dates. And uh, basic pattern matching. So if you haven't had it, you 
before, you want to be able to match patterns in strings. So this is a, a grep. Um, any, has everybody used Unix? No? Has anybody not used Unix? So a few. Okay, so it's not, not surprising. So uh, these are standard things that, uh, from time immemorial, but you want to be able to do regular expressions. And regular expressions are their own strange language that I can never remember because I don't use them that often. And each time I have to go, say, oh God, how do I do this, etc. But you want to be able to look for patterns in the email. So for example, if I'm checking whether it's redacted or not, I'm looking for a pattern that has release here, uh, zero or more spaces, then in, then zero or more spaces, and then part. If I can find that in place, and it's the first time I hit in with zero or more spaces between, etc. Um, I extract it and get a logical, that's logical, so I get a true. If I don't, I get a false. So you want to write a function that's going to go over all the email and extract all the information that you want. So, right. So for an example, just to give you a really simple example of how this works, there's your URL, you've got that big string. I can do that sort of thing. It's going to return true on that string because it does have release in part inside it. And if I had this fragment of HTML all inside the string and I'm looking for the um, uh, two, right? I want to be able to extract uh, who is this email sent to, this part here. Um, the construction is there's a string extract from this thing, this other stuff, which is a bunch of instructions. Okay, it's a very uh, terse. This sort of this thing here means preceded by anything that goes before that like this precedes the thing I'm looking at. This blue part precedes is the pattern that I'm looking for. And then in between I want to match one or more characters. And then I want to end uh, with that, come on, that particular pattern. So that means that when you see that up here. I'm looking for marching along until I get this pattern here after original, and it ends with that. I, I want to grab everything in between. And so I get back that. So you have to use regular expressions if you're dealing with any kinds of search through this kind of messy data. So there's no getting around that. So we end up with a massive CSV file, over 30,000 rows. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the CSV file, and we actually have a couple CSV files just to cache some intermediate results. And you know you got two from who else was on the two who else was on the from, um, whether the date and time, um, day of the week, hour, whether it was redacted or not, and then these various B1, B2, B3, etc., and the actual content. So we got all the information organized in some big table. So the data, the data I want to talk about the to and from. I want to know are they in the U.S. government or are they not in the U.S. government? The U.S. government that ends with .gov, the U.S. federal government, .gov or .mil, military. Or if they're not, what can I tell? Because lots of times it's truncated, I don't have their information. So these redactions, they look at these are Freedom of Information Act codes. So when I'm looking at these, so when I see B1, I know what was redacted was actually a national security and foreign policy matter. Okay, where somebody's determined that that's what it was. It was B5 with some communication between agencies, the federal agencies. It was B6 was personal privacy, and there are all, all kinds of strange things. Uh, curiously, something related to oil and gas wells. Okay, so you're looking for those kinds of things. So just knowing that, I can look this up and see what does this mean. So that's kind of informative in itself, a little more metadata. So uh, for the data, I want to be able to simplify it. And so what I want to be able to do is remove some words that are just uninteresting, uh, et cetera, so-called stop words. And uh, this is a text, uh, what is it, text manipulation, text management, I'm not sure what the, text mining, probably text mining package. Um, and they will have larger lists than this, but these are stop words. So these are words I really don't care about. They're not that interesting. So I want to remove them from any kind of analysis. So. Remove the stop words. <clears throat> I also want to find the stems of words. But there are lots of, I say, uh, I'll just give you an example. 
And it's actually more complicated than this, what we do. But you can imagine that I've got this, the string that's full of these particular words. So I've got open, opening, opens, openings, opera, operatic, operas, operate, operating, operative, et cetera, et cetera. All of these words have different meanings, but some of them have common meanings, like open, op open and opens, certainly part of the same thing. Opening and openings are part of the same thing. So I want to just, what is, think of this as a tree, what is the stem? And these are the leaves, the, the suffixes that are added to it. So I can use a stem document on this thing. And on this list, I get open, 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 open. So those all turn into open. That's opera, that's operat, right? That's opera, that's oper, 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 oper. So you see, you lose a lot of information. But at least you kind of say, hopefully some of these things are much alike, right? So you're losing information, you're conflating some ideas, but they're not too disparate, hopefully. So that's what's done. And then you want to think about, and that's not what we do, but it, that's an example of just turning those into real pieces that you can look at and count, etc. So I've got a whole bunch of opens and some opers, etc. And so I can count how many I have of each of these things, okay? And I can get the unique ones. Uh, so there's uh, my set of words. And you just get the unique ones so that I have all the unique things there. Yeah. How accurate is stemming? Stemming is a whole um, whole research area in itself. And it's much richer than what I've just given you. <laughs> and we had to think uh, you know, hard about it. Same with stop words. What do you put in there? What do you get? So it's uh, there's clearly going to lose information. Simplify things are pretty good. This is third, you know, people that research on what they stem and stuff. So, I want to think about frequency. Uh, number of times any particular term appears in an email, how many times does it appear in an email? Uh, how many emails contain that term? Document frequency. And then this sort of weighted thing, and there are various ways of defining this too, but the simplest thinking about this is just. Uh, the TF IDF term frequency inverse document frequency. So the idea is that if the term appears a lot in an email but hardly in any other emails, wow, that's kind of important to that email. That's a weird term, right? So that that's what you're trying to trying to capture, um, and that's a that's fairly extensively used some variation of TF IDF. So I can order the terms in every email by their term frequency, how frequently here by their TFIDF score. So I have scores on all of the terms in the emails. And I can look at now, I've got these things, I can look at all the emails and just say, what's it, what do I got? Uh, look at the redactions here. Let's just visualize, what am I going to look at? So I'm looking at all of the redactions. There's B1 through B9, and then there's some with none. So there's fewer than half of the emails have no redactions. Right? And a lot of them have B6, these, these personal. And these are the kind of worrisome ones, the B1, the national security, the interagency communications. And um, there's a, I should point out that there's some concern about when you go for FOIA things that people are putting too many redactions in and just declare things. So the fact that they declared this or that is not necessarily an assessment of the magnitude of what they are, but it's, it's what somebody's decided. And they tend to err on the side of redacting more or I might. So I look at the times of the emails. So these are the times sent. Okay, and this is the date going along here. And I've got, it's, if it's a redacted email, it's red. If it's an unredacted, it's blue. And so any patterns. First of all, does she ever sleep? <laughs> this is a 24 hour clock from midnight to midnight, right? The least amount of emails seems to be happening around this time, around 6 to 8 in the evening. Uh, if, we can, if we imagine that this is where actually the time when somebody hit a return key. Other patterns? Anyone? A lot more red early in the morning. A lot more red early in the morning? Possibly. You have to worry a little bit about the overstriking and, and the alpha blending. Yeah? Those are horizontal lines. Okay, so there's something happening on the server. 
that's gathering things or there's a flush or something's happening. That particular, that's what we suppose may be happening. Um, what up, the other thing you notice about these horizontal lines, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. These correspond to uh, uh, daylight savings time changes. So there's lots just looking at that. You can sort of see what, what's going on, these simple things in this email. So you may begin to speculate uh, about the health of a person that was dealing with that much email. And maybe, you know, there's this one downtime, which seems around dinner. Now, we also look at this by day of the week. We find you look at it by day of the week, what happens on Saturdays and Sundays, et cetera. You get some insight into that person's life. I felt like I was a voyeur when I was looking at that just to see what's going on. I'm not showing you that here. But if you just, what's happening with this person on Saturdays and Sundays, et cetera. Um, come on, show me. So here's uh, just a number of emails on any particular day. So that's just a time series going across the date. And there's that volume of emails. So it's you know, going up and down. Is there some here? Yeah? Wait, so in that previous visualization, like there's this one, there's this one sort of like cluster in that open area. Like, if you Yeah, see, there's like that sort of small cluster looking at white space. That seems where, where, like, like sort of, sort of like in the middle between all one and right. between the, this. See that blip, that blip, yeah. That? Like that whole sort of there's like this small. This. Blip, this is blip, yeah. You're calling that a cluster? Well, no, not not and like the space in the, like underneath that as well. Right. Like, where she normally would have dinner now, it's just a bunch. Of <laughs> Here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you you might think about what what what, what was. You know what's hap what what makes this collection of days different from the other days, right? So you might look at yeah. or what what's happening in the world in her world during this time. Yeah. So you can be pretty nosy, right? Look at that. Yeah. So how do you know it's uh, not the unique time or? It's it, all it is is it's the time that I have on the email. So we're trying to speculate what is this? What's going on? But this sort of regularity makes me think that it's something about the machine time that, that's there. Uh, so I have no idea whether that's when she sent it or that's when the machine sent it. Is that all in like or one horizontal line? Is that like one minute almost? Or? It's very, very tight. I can't remember. Oh, that's it's very, very tight. It's like 2 and 3 a.m. Okay. Sorry? I said it's almost what it's like the same time every day. I think it is. The, I think it. Uh, yeah, the question is how fine do I know that? Is that down to the millisecond that I've got, or is that one? And, and I don't remember. I think it's because this is compressing it, of course. They, they could spread out. I don't know. So back to this. So patterns here, if this thing ever works, getting fed up with this. Um, you might think about what are the high volume areas, right? Where what? You know, that's the biggest point. You know, over 120 emails on that day. What was happening? So what I have on the block here is all emails and selected emails with this magenta underneath. And these ones happen to be these are the ones that she sent. This is all including the ones she sent, and the blue, the magenta ones are the ones she sent for that day. So you could ask, what happened here? And this is a uh, uh, August. 21st, and lots of the emails were redacted, mainly B5, that uh, there's also B, lots of B6, that um, interagency stuff. And it turns out this is the battle, of, when the Battle of Tripoli begins. Like, so you can go look and see what's going on in the um, news. Two of Gaddafi's sons are captured, and one of her close chief, uh, close uh, staff members, Jake Sullivan, writes this email, it's called, it's famous now, called the TikTok Libya email. And it, this is crediting Clinton for leading US policy on Libya from start to finish. She's fairly hawkish, right? She wants to overthrow government. I think she probably shouldn't say that on me. Uh, she's fairly hawkish. <laughs> hawkish, fairly hawk. And so you can see that she, there's this famous email where he's setting out what she's done. And she's really driven this whole Libya thing. This is her baby quote from start to finish. So that thing I can look at, since um, Clinton is always in every email, I can see, put her in the center, this egocentric graph, right? So that's Hillary Clinton in the center. 
And these are the top set of correspondence in the whole range of the data. And I've colored them blue if I know that they're governed. It. I've colored them red if I know they're not. And I've colored them yellow if we couldn't tell. Now I know for a fact that this is a government, senior government employee, Wendy Sherman. You can just Google this and see who this person was and when she was hired, etc. And the closer you are to the center, the greater the volume of email between you and Clinton, and also the wider the great wider the scope is, the greater the volume. So you kind of see her inner circle. These are the guys, Cheryl, in this, this is over the whole time here, Cheryl Mills, whom Aberdeen, Jake Sullivan, and you also see this Sidney Blumenthal guy uh, comes in for a lot of criticism for being such an uh, intimate in the email thing. And then Huma Abedin here, one of her chief staff, not chief staff, one of her staff members, also appears over here because she's using Clinton email account. So she's appearing twice. Sometimes this is she's using a .gov account, and here she's using Clinton email account. So you start to get a sense of well, who's talking to who, who's close. The more frequently you and I correspond, the closer we are to each other. So you get some sense of now we're learning more and more about this person. So on the other things I can look at the top 20 term frequencies for the whole thing. And these are STEM, so they're kind of incomprehensible in some places. And the top uh, TFIDF terms. So you'll see things like uh, us or US. Um, that's some sort of security thing, people, nation, Obama. That's, I think, PR. When I looked it up, that's mostly PR, public relations. They were talking about PR appears down here as well. And uh, it's about Jake, Cheryl. It's probably Cheryl Mills appearing, et cetera. So that's over the whole thing. So we're going to look at those things. We're going to build a Shiny app. Okay, so we're building a Shiny app as a part of the web server. And a Shiny app has three pieces. It has a user interface, a server, and something that puts together the Shiny app. And it looks kind of like this. It's much more complicated. So you build a, a user interface, and there's this fucked up fluid page. So these are all things built into the R Shiny package. I didn't mention that. R Shiny package. And you get a fluid page, a title pendant, you know, arguments, um, a fluid row. So the first column here is you know, Christopher's name, then my name, and then um, another fluid row. And there's tons and tons, tons more here. And then the server has got to take input and output. It's a function that takes an input and output. So this is data, effectively, input and output. It does something um, uh, with the in, in input, uh, or pro way of processing it, and it's reactive. So the input somehow it's going to be, something's going to react to the input. And the, the output I'm going to write, I'm going to render some plot. These are all functions that are built in. You can build a shiny app yourself. Just do it in our studio. And then the Shiny app just says, Shiny app, my user interface is that, my server is that, and I'm away to the races. And if you've got an uh, internet connection, you can look at that right now, okay, if you want. If you do, it's going to look like that. Okay, so there's the web interface that we have, and it's got the source WikiLeaks. This is a paper describing that, everything that I'm kind of telling you about today, with lots of references and things that you may find interest if you're a political junkie at all. Uh, some sort of stories here, what you might look at. But the pieces that are here is this piece here, this panel where you're seeing some TFIDF forms, this part up here where it's got some check boxes, some pull down menus, some lists of things, and this scrollable display here. So all the displays I've shown here are going to appear here to scroll through. And then you've got this funny thing, this timeline at the top, the date range. Okay? So these things are all filters. This is what it's going to react to. So um, this is the reference point about that blue and uh, red diagram of whether you want to start at midnight or whatever. Um, whether you want to display the foreign travel, because we went and grabbed the foreign travel schedule from the State Department and just matched it up there. What Do you want to just look at emails that contain particular FOIA codes or not? And do you want to know who, from Clinton to Clinton or all emails? So you can do that sort of thing. This date range is something. So we can look at this um, thing again here, and I can decide I'm moving these points in to a, a square. So that's this particular date range now, 19th of August 2011 to 23rd of August 2011, that little range. This diagram will react in response to that. 
and show you that so you get to see what's going on in that particular image. Okay? So that's the uh, Tripoli, Battle of Tripoli there. You see what's going on there. And as soon as you do that, all of the other things, the TFI, the internal frequency, everybody, everybody's updated with their spots and dots. So I can also say, in that range, just show me the emails that are from Clinton, so I can see who she's sending to. Thomas uh, Donnellan here, which is uh, not from it, not in a government account. We could tell it was a not a government account. These ones we couldn't tell. And here's our Oscar Flores we saw. That's Madeline um, Albright, former Secretary of Staff, Pathfinder, and other people. So Jake Sullivan, these three people still appear fairly frequently, the Chief of Staff and the others, Monica Hanley. And you say, well, that's who she's sending to. Is that different from who's sending to her? So if you look at who's sending to her, of course, uh, we see Sidney Blumenthal sending to her, sending her lots of stuff. And some other people are sending her uh, things to get these three people, as you saw before, Henry Slaughter, Monica Hanley. But a couple, of, a couple of people have changed, and also the intensity is different. So you can learn a lot about what's going on just from uh, filtering. So if I look at uh, all the emails from her, what are, what are the FOIA codes? emails that come from her in this time range right and I look at um, and this is this is the um, that's the Battle of Tripoli time range so a few B ones like that uh, <coughs> the emails that are going to her huh, is that a different distribution right this this doesn't look like that notice that it's not the same axis uh, so this doesn't look quite the same shape as this uh, emails from her have a lot more B5s and B6s together then uh, emails to her, of course, have a lot of none. Therefore, no, code, no redactions. So again, uh, same period on this, looking at the TFIDF and the highest frequency, the Battle of Tripoli, and you can look at these pieces, you know, historic uh, Tripoli. Um, I think that's a trim version of the Juppé, uh, is a French say since we're being recorded, but I, I think military connection or political connection, look it up. Also people, different people's names you see appear here. Um, so you can learn a lot about what, what was going on in the email just from that, that little time period. And just another people that are going on now. Sorry? You're talking like one of the highest things <laughs> is email. email. And this is to her, which may be different, talking about Ticker, Tripoli, Taruni, Gaddafi, New Stick. Gaddafi, Libya, so it's all, you know, Battle of Jordan, look at this Benghazi transit, so it's all a lot of Libyan stuff. You can see. So I want to look at the last two years now. So look at the last two years in the database um, and see what's going on, see the pin principles that are involved. You'll see now Tony Blair is showing up, ACLB, uh, as one of the top guys here in the, in the last two years. Sidney Blumenthal, always there. And, um, Different maybe information here. If I look at just the B1 and B5s, right, because this is national security and interagency stuff, there's redactions that are supposed to be like this and ask who's involved. And I'm still seeing like Tony Blair, Oscar Flores, and Sidney Blumenthal. And that's kind of weird, right, if they really were things. Um, so I get to learn, learn a, a little bit about that. And what we discovered, we didn't know who ACLB was, but we noticed this wind rush kept popping up. What the heck is Windrush, right? So we start going around and find out Windrush is one of Tony Blair's many companies that he's using to make money with uh, after he gave Prime Minister of the UK. So it's a, you can go, go look at this, it's a fascinating story of all the um, places where he may or may not be having influence or making money. Um, again, the last two years, there's the Battle of Tripoli. You might think, well, what other course patterns are there? You know, what's going on with this big bump at the Getting, you can see those lines more easily now. And um, this is all of the email and all codes. So if I look over here on this bit, this is where TikTok Libya occurs, these, these three peaks here. Uh, this is the beginning of the thing uh, to the getting rid of Gaddafi and um, overthrowing the government in Libya. So the Libyan embassy in Washington was suspended on March 25th. Uh, Russian abstention and other support obtained for the UN no-fly 
Libya and March 19th, NATO operations begin in Libya. Those are the peaks. So you can see what's going on in the news at that time. Uh, this is B1 only in this very small time period in that part where it's leading up to the, uh, the part we were just looking at here, the TikTok Libya re uh, region. And so you see um, England, Baris, Parliament, Mahmoud, Gaddafi, uh, Windrush again. But that's because that's because this guy's still playing. And these are B1s. This is national security. And uh, what was the other part? It's, 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 it's the most important thing because Sidney Blue was all involved here as well. And it's Tony Blair, Sidney Blue, and all. Whom I have any coming in on his email. Uh, uh, not appearing on the government. Oh, no, actually, it's just one government side. So you might think, well, see any other patterns here? We looked at these peaks, they're kind of interesting things, high volume zones. On the other end, there's a trough. And there's this nice blank spot right down the middle here. There's an email gap. There's another one over here. There was no email there. All right, what's going on? Pardon me? <laughs> Just slept for three days to catch up on sleep. So. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, come on. All right. Crossing in front of your camera. So, there's the gap, right? That's a fairly substantial gap. And if I look at it, that's from October 26th, November 9th, 2012. 2012, no email appears in the archive as being sent from Secretary Clinton during that time. Zero. <clears throat> you may recognize some of those dates. October 26th, this is when the Fox News story broke about the CIA operatives with Benghazi. Defended against terrorists. In fact, they came forward with a story of what happened on the ground. And they maintain that it was an organized attack to tell reporters that they were told to stand down. So that news story breaks on the 26th. So looking at this gap, you're saying, well, what's going on either side? What is there, you know, what's happening? Well, that's one thing that's happening on one side of it. And November 6th, in the middle here, is when Obama is elected to the second term as president. So it's the time of the election as well. So right after all this Benghazi thing's breaking and, and it's getting really hot, uh, and just before the election, there's no email from Clinton, which is interesting, and very little email to her. Okay, so during the same period, we might say, well, maybe we get some sense if we just looked at this period by itself, all these zeros, right? The little line is Clinton. This is all email, the black line on top. You say, okay, who's involved here? And if you look around, these are often people, Pathfinder, uh, James P. Rubin, uh, Robert Kagan, people that are naturally advisors on, on foreign stuff to the Secretary of State that you may be talking to. And if you look at the TFIDF terms, you see some interesting stuff like Ansar Sharia, right? Ansar al Sharia, the group that attacked Benghazi. Uh, Mangush, uh, Misrata, Militia, Heavy Capture, Haftar. If you just start Googling this stuff, you know, just learn it's all about Libya and what's going on here. Um, fight with Sharia, Eber Sudan. These are people and places. So that's kind of interesting. I guess I'm just drawing your attention to that now. Yeah, it's all, this is all Benghazi. Which is why I made you suffer through all those videos at the beginning. So you've got this context. So you can move this window. I've moved this window all the way along, about a 30-day 30, 30 window. And the thing will update all the time. You can sort of pull the middle and watch it go through. And so I'm saying, really, is there, maybe there are other spots where there's no email if I take a fine look. 
So I go look and they're searching for patches where there's no email from Clinton. Then check against other sources, like I get to check against you know, nearby email, your travel schedule, etc. But I'm also going to check the dates against the news items via Google search. And I'm going to try to confine myself in the following way. I'm going to follow this protocol. So I identify all the patches of days that contain no email from Clinton. I identify the month and year of each patch. And then for each patch, I do this search. Month, year, in quotes, news, State Department, in quotes. And I see what I get on the first page. Okay? So I report relevant stories from the first page of results. For example, if I'm Google of June 2009, do State Department, I get this, my browser. So this is a time when there's no email from her. And I see, well, what, what appears there in the story? And well, she, well, she fractured her elbow. She's not going to be doing email, right? So that kind of makes sense. So that's a time when there's zero, zero email. So there are 10 more patches. There are 10 patches, including that one. A little or no email from from Clinton. Defining what a patch is is a bit ambiguous, as you'll see. You know, it's a few, few days in a row or days near each other. And I do that check against news item via that Google search. That's all email, all methods. So the first big patch is the early days, January to April 2009. And this is what you find there is she's using her personal BlackBerry for all the email communications. Um, the national security folks explained to her the risk, explained the risks to Cheryl Mills, her uh, chief of staff, and the officials seem to be unaware of the private server, just that she's using her, her BlackBerry. Um, so that's what's happened there. June seventeenth to twenty third, she had surgery for an elbow fracture after she fell. That makes sense. July seventeenth, twenty third, while well, she's visiting India and Thailand, so you're not expecting your which you're overseas on some mission, you're worried about what's going on nearby, you're worried about eavesdroppers, etc. So maybe you're not, uh, you know, that kind of makes sense. October 11th to 13th, while well, she's visiting Russia, well, it made sense in Indian Thailand, it sure sounds like it sense in Russia, right, that she's not going to be doing very much. April 11th to 15th, well, there's a forwarded email that describes the ambassador's concerns about the situation in Ajitabaya, which is about 150 kilometers from Benghazi, and then he's considering leaving Benghazi. It's too dangerous. And April 14th to 15th, in this time period again, so this is just before, forwarded email to her, just before at the AL, she's meeting with the NATO foreign ministers in Germany. Again, not so surprising, but those are the items that show up. Uh, August 27th to 29th and September 1st, here's what I observe here there's no foreign travel. What I saw was Russian hackers, which are kind of famous again, are trying phishing uh, Clinton's email accounts. Um, and Cheryl Mills, her chief of staff, adds a significant Clinton Foundation donor. This guy gave a lot of money to the Clinton Foundation to this International Security Advisory Board. I invite you to go look into that and see what, what you think about it. But that, that's a bit unusual. It makes the news. And um, Executive Secretary of the State Department suggests replacing Clinton's personal BlackBerry by a department-issued one, and Huma Abedin says, well, no, forget that. That's actually her BlackBerry or whatever. She is rebuffed. So that's what I find. Those are the observations. March 27, 29, 31st to April 3rd and April 10th. Sort of lump these together. Observation, Clinton staffers seem to be betting email. That's what it, uh, it mentions. And Clinton received an email which in part obtained classified material. Contained classified material. That's what I find in the news. August 27th, 30th, September 1st, 2nd, and well, this is just before the Benghazi thing, right? <clears throat> so the, there's an August 8th cable to Secretary of State uh, called the Guns of August Security in Eastern Libya from the ambassador who says, What we have seen are not random crimes of opportunity, but rather targeted and discriminated attacks. That's from the ambassador. And State Department security agents Tripoli reduced from 34 to 6 during the August. That's in Tripoli, the main, that's for the embassy, that's not Benghazi. Um, this last bit, I'll lump these together December 6th to 17th, 19th of 2012, 22nd, 23rd, 25th, 
January 1 through January 6. I mean, you look like it's maybe it's Christmas or something like that, but it's not in other years, right? So if you look, look at this, and that's why I lumped them together there. The purple of the magenta is hers, and there's not much coming in, but it's, you know, a few spikes, etc. This is her foreign travel just overlaid in that time period. And the frequencies, what's happening here, and you'll look that these are kind of familiar terms, Bangush, uh, Zidane, Benghazi, oil, um, Libyan, etc. So I lump those together, and here's what I find. She has a concussion from a fall, and she's recovering at home by December 15th. Um, four state department employees associated with Benghazi resign on December 19th. One of these alleges that in October 2012, he witnessed a Sunday afternoon, quote, document sorting session in the basement of the October 2012, remember the dates, uh, in the basement of the State Department after Congress had called for documents related to Benghazi and uh, Cheryl Mills and Jake Sullivan were present. So that's an allegation from this guy. In December, Mills and Samuelson made aware of the FOI, uh, FOIA December 6th request for they learned about that then on in December. And Susan Rice, remember Susan Rice at the beginning of Meet the Press? Her, it seemed her ambition was to become Secretary of State after Clinton, which would be a good exposure to go on Meet the Press afterwards. She's decided to withdraw her name for consideration. So that's all what's happening in December in that time period. And that's again just from that Google source. So that seems like a lot of hits. But they kind of make, you know, you're either something is a problem or you think there's something suspicious. So it's a, either something's obvious or something is suspicious or contentious in these things whenever we hit something. Um, but maybe that's always the case for the non obvious things, right? So we want to be a little bit honest. You know, maybe that's just the nature of being Secretary of State. So, sanity check. The sanity check is the following I randomly select. 10 month year combinations from all the ones that are available. And I reproduce the Google search and examine the results. So, again, here are the 10 selected at random. <clears throat> June 1, uh, sorry, June 2011. This is all I could find. Sex state cables. So, sex state is when it's officially from the Secretary of State, but to be fair, you know, I'm not sure the President of UW reads everything that goes out in his name, so there, there's some ambiguity. But, the irony here is funny that the Secretary of State, Cables of State Department, has changed their passwords to concern about security. On uh, 2 November, uh, U.S. Embassy cables appear on WikiLeaks. Having to suggest Clinton use a government email account, Clinton says no. Um, 12, well, we got that one already, December 2012. Um, March 2009, Clinton hits the reset button with Russia, going to have new good relations with Russia. Um, that's what appears in the news. 2011, Clinton delivers remarks on global food security. March 2011, she rejects talks with Gaddafi's sons. Uh, P.J. Crowley is forced to resign. Uh, May 2012, State Department investigated compute, computer shipments to Iran. Uh, Putin accuses Clinton of encouraging Russian pro protests. And June 2012, she even one conference on Syria. Also, Bill Clinton checked with the State Department on a paid speech to a group with Tehran ties, uh, State Department trafficking in persons report. And uh, number 10, Iranian plot to kill Saudi ambassador. The State Department cannot confirm Gaddafi's death. So those are the news items I found in the randomly selected. Okay, <clears throat> so none but December 2012 happened to hit on. So the random selection versus the selection of one name was your email. They send, seem to turn up two different collections of news stories. So what do we worry about? Well, be aware of your confirmation bias. Right? So this goes back to at least Francis Bacon. It's very natural for us. If I was an editor on some particular flavor of uh, media outlet or something, I might be wanting to really push this as smoking gun stuff, right? I was already predisposed. If I'm on the other side of the fence and I look at it, I say, well, gee, what is that? I mean, uh, but uh, surely it's explainable or something like that. Um, I think when we try to do them side by side, it does look like there's kind of unusual stuff going on there. Whatever you're, I mean, we have no 
course in this race, right? We're up on this side of the border, so it's whatever. And you think about the logic of significance testing. So if you think about significance testing, either the hypothesis is true, and we have by chance observed something unusual, so by chance, or the hypothesis is false. And the more unusual the result, the greater the evidence against the hypothesis that arose by chance. So we're, when you're doing a hypothesis test, you're doing exactly the same sort of thing. So that's what we try to do with that Google search, right? Assuming that it was completely unconnected, that these stories happened to be by chance, you know, how was unusual were the numbers that I saw? They looked kind of pretty unusual. So maybe that's evidence against the hypothesis that there was by chance. Or maybe we just saw something very unusual. You clearly need much more information. So there appears to be strong evidence against the hypothesis. And certainly, that largest email, any test of missing and random, it's going to fail. If that's not missing and random, why that's missing, one can only speculate. Uh, so I want to finish with here that note that the data collection and cleaning are not without their problems, and much more effort uh, should be taken in a more thorough cleaning of the data. It's really problematic getting that stuff. And the last thing I say is uh, mega metadata uh, connects to other sources. Don't forget that. There's no such thing as uninformative data. And inferences were made from metadata, which can be made, which cannot require some care. <coughs> Mistakes will be made. Be very cautious when you're doing this sort of stuff. That web application, if you have a chance to look at it, provides an analysis tool, and it provides for people that maybe know a lot more about this stuff than you or I know about this. But it's a nice tool to have beside the WikiLeaks or the State Department search mechanism that is to look for patterns either in an exploratory fashion, down here, exploratory, see what's going on, or you've got a previous hypothesis that you've got independently, and you're trying to assess it on what you use by looking for something in the data. We've done a little bit of both, but mostly, mostly exploratory stuff here. So if you're interested, by the way, the more interesting is to construct a more general tool that will construct these kinds of websites. And I hope I've convinced you that uh, proper analysis really you need to understand the context. There's a story around every data science. You just don't do it. Data science is not just looking at numbers. There's times I've looked, it's always embedded in that context. And I think this is going to be interesting for some time to come. This is just last uh, June 29th. We're still after those emails that are missing. That were all declared personal. So that's it. That's the story of our email playing around. Yeah. Any questions? Want to get out of here? It's a long story, but you see, you have, to cap, you have to give it some context. And when you're doing your own analysis, it's really important that you get your head around the context. And that, to me, that's a great thing about doing statistics or data science is actually uh, taking a, a collection of a set of tools and applying them. Biomedical one day, the sort of political another day, um, industrial stuff. It's, it's pretty fun. Yeah. Just for clarification, do you have two sets of emails? One from US government and one from WikiLeaks? Yeah, the same. Same, but I'm just asking you. So, no, I, it's from WikiLeaks because all the, all the State Department has are PDFs. So, so they're all, they all came as PDFs. WikiLeaks has some presumably automatic reading the PDFs, turning it into HTML. There are some problems, which you pointed out, missing some data, dates being not quite right, so there's some systematic thing going on. Um, but, you know, if you want to try to, those are scanned, and they're not easily searchable PDFs up here. Any signs that the weekly emails were doctored? No. No, everyone's matched, the PDF matches. Why would you think that? Russian hackers stole it. They use it for that. No, this is this is legit release stuff. Okay. This is the this is the stuff released by Congress. Um, I mean, these Russian hackers are multi mythology. So they match. Yeah. Question back there. Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, I'm thinking, does WikiLeaks have any of the deleted emails that aren't available? 
Well, no. Well, that's, that's what I told you. The story, this is it. There's, so, in, roughly speaking, half of the email, by Hillary Clinton's statement, half of the email was deleted, deleted permanently using bleach fit, not, not you know, delete, uh, but destroy, right? Destroy all backups of all of the email. Half of it is, is gone because it was personal. And who declared it was personal? Where were those three people that rehearsed that? They didn't want to have a neutral third party. So I mean, these things all start to line up. And then we find patterns. You begin to scratch your head. It doesn't look like it's missing or random. Whether it's missing systematically uh, because of some error on their part, perhaps. Whether it was systematically missing by intention, perhaps. I don't know. No, it's the same. That's it. That's why I say it's, it's going to be interesting for some time to come. We just sort of scratched it. But if, if you, you follow this, it, it, so if you look at that website, you look at that paper that we wrote, which describes the stuff, that'll take you off down many, many little rabbit holes. Because all, all the links there are, are active and can get you news, news items and so on. Like when I discovered this stuff, I was really kind of annoyed. I didn't want to discover that. Because so then I'd have to write about it and write carefully about it. Like it's not like we're going hunting for it. I just thought this would be a fun, dirty way to say goodbye that that was topical. Yeah, there are other, there are other uh, sets of email that are on WikiLeaks that are not there by. Did she get replies from Albright? It's because you show that there were emails sent to Albright, but she never received them. Sorry? No, no, when, when you're looking at that egocentric graph, you uh -huh. this books, no, that's not all of the emails. That's just the top thing. What we did is we ordered the frequency of emails, and then looked for a gap. Like when, when, when a group separate, we try and just identify their inner circle. There's email going back and forth between them. Oh, okay. It's just, it may not be in the top. That's it. Well, I hope that was of some interest or value.